I'm now going to call on the last speaker sitting right there, uh, there, and that is Bartil Tugonden from the Norwegian School of Economics. He's going to talk on a, a theme called Fairness in an Unfair World. Bartil is known to many of us. He's been a member of the NFU for as long as I can remember. As long as I have, probably. And uh, one of the things that I wanted to mention about you is that he just—he is just about to start up a 10-year program, a center of excellency, with the very short and very important title, simply fair. And the questions are: What is fairness? How do people value fairness? What are the differences? And this, again, in my political science world, is now getting down to the micro level. We got down to political behavior and individuals. So, Bartil, the floor is yours. The same rule applies to you and to the audience for questions. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks a lot for giving me the opportunity to um, present for you. Uh, so, so, basically, when we, when we think about uh, research and inequality in global development, I think it's important to keep in mind that there are three perspectives that one, one can take. So, one is the normative approach, where you think about how we ought to relate to inequality and global development. The second one is the more positive approach where you try to explain the processes of inequality and global development, and particularly how that relates to human behavior. And the third one is the descriptive approach where you try to describe and measure uh, inequality and global development. And clearly, I mean, these three approaches are very much linked. A very early, um, early um, uh, paper that, uh, pointing this out was a paper by Amartya Sen saying, calling, we called description as choice, which basically said that, well, when we are doing this simple task of describing and measuring, we have to pick something to describe and something to measure. So when we want to describe inequality, when we want to describe global development, we have to focus on something. And what will we focus on? Well, we will focus on what we think is normatively important. And I think this was very much in line with Rohini's uh, presentation. My focus will be on the positive side. I really want to look at and talk to you guys about how people perceive inequality. So basically how people perceive the normative question of how to interpret fair and unfair inequalities. I think this again, relates to the normative and descriptive questions, and hopefully we can discuss this at the end. But I think it's important to have in mind these three uh, dimensions. So my first point that I hope that you will take away from, from my lecture is basically the point that when you think about human behavior and moral motivation, you have to keep in mind that fairness, the fairness aspect is fundamental. And I thought about how should I best illustrate this for you, and the way I will do it is that I will take you to what I think is an unbelievable story in economics. A really striking event that took place in 2008. So in 2008, we were in the middle of the financial crisis. And what happened in 2008 was that 200 of the leading economists in the world, some of them are here pictured, basically wrote a letter that was published in the New York Times, uh, as a response to a plan that was proposed to the Congress about how to handle the financial crisis. And I just think it's amazing to see these guys write a letter saying that economists of the world unite. So now the question is, what were, so what were they, so they were super worried clearly, since they were writing this thing and coordinating, it takes a lot of effort. So what were their worries? So what were these economists writing on macro and econometrics, statistics, et cetera, et cetera? What was their main worry about the plan that was proposed about how to handle the financial crisis? So you may have ideas about this, but the main worry they had, the main worry was about the fairness or lack of fairness of this plan. So these guys, not typically not even mentioning in their lectures fairness or moral motivation or anything like that. When the really, really important public issue came uh, into play, that was their focus. That was their main focus. It was not cost, it was not, it was not incentives, it was about the fairness of the plan. I think this is a striking, striking illustration of the importance of fairness for moral motivation and for human behavior. There are many interesting aspects with this, um, uh, with this, um, uh, with this uh, quote that I have here. Another one is that they say, what they say here is it's the fairness. 
In, and they say, investors who took risks to earn profits must also bear the losses. So basically, they are here relating uh, the issue of fairness to the individual choices of people. And I will come back to that in, in a second. So now my second main point is, well, <laughs> so we, the, 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 the title of this, uh, this um, session is on inequality. So is fairness in, are fairness and inequality the same concept, the same idea? And in order to study this, we conduct experimental studies, um, which has become quite prominent in economics. And I want basically to give you the highlight of one of the studies we did uh, of this kind, where we basically tried to tease out whether or to what extent equality is really capturing people's notion of fairness. And keep in mind that I'm not defending anything here. I'm basically just trying to get the uh, ideas of, of individuals. So this is a study where we compare, uh, we compare uh, the moral behavior, distributive behavior of 1,000 Americans and 1,000 Norwegians. So why did we pick Americans and Norwegians in this comparison? Well, it's pretty obvious that, I mean, there are huge differences, as Carly talked about, when, you come, uh, when it comes to inequality and redistribution, when you compare Norway and, and, and the U.S. And here you see a, a, a scatter plot of the measured inequality in these societies, and you see that Norway has pretty low levels of inequality, exposed taxation, while the U.S. is an outlier uh, in the other direction when you compare the OECD countries. So what we wanted to do in this setting, of course, this, this is a huge topic, and many people have many theories and explanations for why we see these differences. What we wanted to do in this setting was basically to take and create a controlled environment where we ruled out many of the possible explanations for why we see these differences and look at whether there are fundamental differences in how Americans and Norwegians perceive the idea of inequality. So I can't go into the details of this study, but I want to highlight three dimensions of this study. So first of all, it's a large-scale study involving 1,000 Americans, 1,000 Scandinavians, or Norwegians. The second is uh, that in this study, they make real choices. So we had people working for us, for our research group, and basically then we asked the Americans and the Norwegians to make real choices about how to pay these uh, workers. And basically, then we randomly allocated um, these um, Americans and Norwegians into different situations that they had to de make a decision for. In all situations, the case was that initially we had given all the money, six US dollars, to one of the workers and nothing to the other. So there was an initial extreme level of inequality in this study. And the question that the Americans and uh, Norwegians had to handle is, so each of them made a choice for two workers, is how do I, what do I think about this inequality? Do I want to eliminate it? Do I want to leave it as it is? And they were in the power to do so, and we paid out to the workers, and they knew that, whatever they decided. And in this study, which is quite important as well, we also, the, the, the people making the choices, also knew about the source of the inequality and they knew about the cost of redistribution. So what do we find in this study? Let me first show what we find in a setting where this initial inequality is due to just bad luck for one of the guys. So they have done exactly the same job. And randomly, we gave everything to one guy and not to the other. So it's just bad luck that has created this inequality. So what do Americans think about such a situation? Do they want to do anything about it? And what we basically find, what you see here, is the share of Americans that want to completely equalize in this setting. And you see that that's more than 50%. So it's not that Americans don't care about inequality. In this case, they find it around 50% say that, well, this was completely randomly determined. That's not fair. We want to equalize it. The interesting question now is, another group of Americans, they were allocated into a setting where the one who had, all, had received all the money, the $6, were the guy who had done a better job. Right? So my interest now in, the initial inequality is the same, so if everything is about inequality, you should see the exactly same behavior. But what happens to inequality acceptance in this case? How, to what extent are people willing to accept this inequality? And what you see is that there is an enormous change in inequality acceptance. As soon as the inequality is due to one person having done a better job than the other, 
then largely people in the USA, then it's fine. Then we don't want to do anything about it. So what about Norway? So we did exactly the same thing in Norway. We put them in exactly the same environment. And what do we find? And what we find in Norway is, Norway is not like this super egalitarian society where everyone says that whatever inequality is a problem. We see basically exactly the same effect. When the inequality is due to merit, what we call here, that one guy was better, there is a large increase in inequality acceptance. While when the inequality is due to luck, there is an enormous uh, lack of acceptance, enormous uh, focus on we need to equalize. And you see that the, that is the second huge finding in this paper, that we see that, I mean, if you compare the behavior and the luck treatment with the behavior and the luck treatment for Americans, you see that Norwegians are much less likely to accept inequalities due to luck. But basically, this shows that <laughs> exactly the same inequality, very different responses for people. So people care about the source of the inequality. That's my first, uh, first message. So you may think, well, these were small stakes and this kind of stuff. So why, how, to what extent does this really matter for real world politics? I love this slide, so I just quickly show it. Basically, we have now plotted in to this, into the same graph showing the inequality in these societies. The inequality am implemented in our experiment. And you see in Norway, that's almost exactly the same as level of inequality we see in Norway, and roughly the same for the US as well. There are many things we can discuss about this, and, and we can come back that, to that at the end. So <clears throat> my third main point is to say, so we see that fairness is not the same as inequality. So what, is, what do people think about when they think about fairness? And largely what we have pushed is that it seems that fairness to a great extent is related to this idea of personal responsibility. So this idea of personal responsibility is really a fundamental moral ideal in the Western societies that we should be held, so, uh, we should be held personally responsible for the choices we make. And we see this, I mean, of course, I mean, this may be important for incentive reasons. You really want people to think carefully about the consequences. But you see that also when people debate fairness issues, not only in economics, but for example, also in health. So in health, when there are lifestyle diseases discussed, I mean, largely there is a focus on, well, the people are, after all, responsible for the choices they make. I think this raises a really fundamental questions about how we should understand this idea of personal responsibility and how people understand it. And that goes to a very deep question, I think, in economics. What is really a morally relevant choice? So when we see people accepting a job in a sweatshop, is that a morally relevant choice? I mean, they were forced into it, right? They had no other opportunities, maybe. So to what extent should they be held morally responsible for this, uh, this question? When there is not a level playing field, what should we make out of choice in that case? And these are the topics they have, that we are studying also together with Kalle. And what we find is that there seems to be a kind of attribution bias. I mean, picking a word from, from psychology, where people very largely tend to focus on the merit of what someone has done, much more than on, 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 uh, on the lack of opportunities and, and bad luck. So, how does this relate to the question of global inequalities? Uh, in some sense, I mean, <laughs> the fundamental question is, why don't we see more support for global redistribution? And Alna wrote in a, like, in, in, a, in, a, in a piece in the newspaper announcing this session, well, we know from Milano's work that 60% of global inequality can be assigned to where you are born and 20% to your family background. These things you can't be held morally responsible for, so if uh, personally responsible for. So if that's so important, why don't we basically see more support for uh, global uh, redistribution? So I want to talk a little bit about this at the end. And, and let me first start with two possibilities. So one possibility, which I think typically comes to mind, is, well, it's because we are selfish. I mean, it, it's the self. I mean, so we, we, we recognize it, but we are selfish. Absolutely, I'm an economist. <laughs> I absolutely believe in people to some extent being selfish. I think that's too cheap of an answer. So we have done lots of studies where we find systematically that people to some extent are selfish, but we also feel very much that people focus on, in different situations, what is the fair outcome. And much more than, I mean, economists have been willing to accept, and much more than what can really explain if this were all about selfishness. So we have, a, and it's not like, Fairness is a luxury good. So we have a study with, with Kalle where we basically did this kind of exercise in, 
Norway, uh, Tanzania, Uganda, and Germany, and we basically compared behavior. And we see that in Tanzania and Uganda, where people, where people have uh, basically are making decisions that are of the size of a month's salary, they basically focus a lot on getting it right in fairness terms. So, it, so, so it's, not like, it's not like fairness is only something that we can afford. What about efficiency? So, um, so economists will typically say, well, we need inequality, and, and, and Kali talked about this, we need inequality to secure growth, to secure the, the, an increasing pie. Is that really what maps into people's behavior? And here I want to show you completely new data. I've never shown it before, so I'm super proud about that. Um, and I, I, it's also pretty striking data I will show you in the end. So I'm really curious to hear what you think about it. So what I'm interested in is, well, do people say that, okay, so we have to accept a certain level of unfairness because that increases the pie in society. So we want to maximize the total pie, and I mean, incentives, reason, or whatever, make, make, I mean, make, implies that we have to accept some, some level of inequality. So we, some level of inequality and unfairness. So we wanted to test this in an experimental setting. And here's the first test, maybe it's an obvious one for you. The first example, so basically these uh, the people participating in this study were told that there were two guys who had done some work. I'll not go into all the details. And they were known to decide how to pay these two guys. Uh, they had two options. So one option was to buy both, paid, both of them $2. The other option was to pay one $5 and the other $1. So if you look at this, it seems like quite clear what's the fair thing to do. I mean, they've done exactly the same job. There's absolutely no reason to discriminate between them. So, I mean, going for $2 seems to be the obvious choice in some sense. But of course, as you see here, if you actually accept a little bit of inequality, you can manage to get these guys $6 in total. So to what extent are people interested in this, I mean, maximizing the total amount of money for these two guys when they're making choices on their behalf? So what, so what, what do we find? Well, we find that it, it matters very little. Basically, this is the share of people saying that, well, we want to give 2-2. And that's basically everyone in a quantitative sample in Norway. So it seems like this idea of an uh, important bite in, in, in people's moral motivation. Now comes the really striking thing, because economists may say, well, but this is not really the right way of, of thinking about efficiency. So here is what we asked a different group of people. So we asked them, well, actually, the same, uh, almost the same question. So you can either choose between giving these two workers two US dollars, each get two, or you can give them, pay them by a lottery, where one gets five, and the other gets one, or, the, or vice versa. And it's equally likely. I think this is a very, very interesting situation. First of all, I mean, you easily see that there is equal ex-ante opportunity here. I mean, ex-ante, before the, the risk is uh, resolved, both have exactly the same opportunities. So, so it, it immediately illustrates that this talk about we just have to secure equal opportunities doesn't make much, much sense. Because in many cases, we have to choose different market where only the winner takes all, right? So in some sense, for an economist, it would be a no-brainer, in some sense, that was our test. If both workers want this, that's what you give them, right? So what is the problem with this particular uh, option? The problem is that there is exposed inequality. So again, we see this, uh, this exposed inequality. Exposed seems unfair. So one guy ended up with very little for this work. The other guy ended up with a lot. So now we really see this as a test of what do people care about in this setting? Is it really efficiency? Is that what really people have in mind? Or is it the fairness aspect? And I have to say, when I basically got the data, I was shocked. So the response, and this is a comparison, doesn't move. I mean, people focus on the fairness side of things. And we have seen this, this is not only in Norway, we have seen this in the US as well. Efficiency for people in general is not very important. They want to get right uh, the fairness side of things, that, that's what they focus on. So we see here that it goes down a little bit, but it's still 75% who says, even if both workers want it, we want to focus on what is, what is fair. So I don't think, I mean, I don't think, 
I don't think we can, um, I don't think we can explain the lack of su uh, support for um, uh, global redistribution by people just being selfish or by people being obsessed as economists are with efficiency. I think we have to go back to the moral motivation side of it. What I really believe is that to a large extent, we find, it f find our fortune fair. Not perfectly fair, maybe, but we find that we deserve, deserve the kind of money we have. After all, we created it. And, and that, is, that is to a large extent why we can live with this kind of thing. There is another side of this as well, and that is, that is when we think about fairness, whom do we include in the group of people that we, uh, that we, that we feel morally, we have a moral obligation towards? This is a huge question, both in political theory and in, um, and in um, political philosophy, where there has been a divide between those who say we have moral obligations towards everyone in the world, versus those who argue that basically the nation state creates some kind of, uh, creates some, some kind of platform for, um, for, um, for, uh, for whom you primarily have a, more, have a moral obligation towards. And actually, we tested this also experimentally. And what we focused on was to what extent does collaboration, the fact that you have collaborated with someone, to what extent does that really create a, create a feeling of moral obligation towards people when they, in the end, are unlucky or whatever? And what we see is that that's enormously important. Basically, our moral circle seems to be defined largely by whom we collaborate with. So if we have someone we collaborate with, we really think that we also owe this guy owe, uh, our help if, if needed. And I think this is of great importance for understanding the huge <laughs> issues now with global migration, with the influx of, uh, of new people to, to, our, to Europe and our country and so on. If we manage to get them involved in the big scheme of collaboration, that will change people's perception of um, uh, of our moral obligations. If not, we basically will don't play that. And, we, and, and, and my big message is that I think we really have to look at the morals, our moral motivation to understand why we don't see more uh, support for global redistribution. I, I, I said it, I don't believe that selfishness is that important, but here selfishness may be actually somewhat important because selfishness may play in in shaping our moral views. So it may be the case that, I mean, what you actually perceive as morally right is shaped by what benefits you. And a lot of people have looked into this, and actually the evidence is quite mixed. And here again, I think it's important to think of this both in the short term and in the long term. So do you at any moment in time basically try to fool yourself to think that what's fair in this particular situation is what benefits yourself? To be honest, we don't find a lot of evidence for that. But where we find some evidence is for long-term uh, effects of a self-serving bias. It seems like, I mean, if you compare, for example, societies, that, I mean, in societies where it's beneficial to be a meritocrat, to believe in, I mean, whoever produces something has the right to, uh, for, to, to these resources, I mean, these societies tend also to be more meritocratic. Vice versa, societies where which are poorer, tend to be much more egalitarian. And actually, you also see this within societies. So we also have studies where we compare, um, we compare across socioeconomic backgrounds, and you see the same kind of tendency. Family, if kids, for example, coming from families, successful families and so on, tend to be more meritocratic, while uh, poorer kids tend to be more, um, tend to be more um, egalitarian. So, so certainly, I mean, we need more understanding of the self-serving bias. Um, a fundamental question that I touched upon in the beginning is, of course, what, to what extent should this matter for our normative answers? What, how we ought to organize society? How we ought to handle global inequality? That is a very deep question, discussed a lot in philosophy, to what extent we should trust our own and, and people's intuitions, and I will not really focus on that. Um, okay, one final slide. I, and I never saw this or that. So, oh, you forgot. Okay, good. Okay, two minutes. This is the final slide. So basically, what I want to um, uh, what what I want to stress to you is that 
I think we, I mean, I think we have to nuance the, the inequality debate. I think a lot of stuff is missed or lost if we always focus on inequality in our language. It's a lot about disciplining ourselves. So we really need to think about which inequalities do we or a society believe is fair and which inequalities does a society believe is unfair. And relating to what Kalle said about much larger responses in small societies than in large societies, in societies with large inequalities, this may be exactly because the level of inequality in a society may shape how we think about the inequality. And secondly, I want to keep in, uh, you to keep in mind, and this is stressed a lot to economists in particular, that fairness is absolutely fundamental for moral motivation and human behavior. So whenever we think about policies, where, <laughs> how to organize stuff at the labor place, um, in, in a company or an organization, whatever, we need, together with selfishness, to place fairness at the front and really think about how will the fairness aspect play out in this particular situation. And then to end, I want to end on a sociological note. I think the sociologists have pushed for a long time something that we have not really thought enough about in economics. And that is what is shaping our ideas or our notions of fairness, our preferences for certain outcomes and so on. And a lot of that, I mean, sociologists will point out, is about the institutions. It is about the, the institutions to be choose. And for economists, this is super important because typically we have said, let's take the preferences of people and then find optimal institutions. But there is a super important feedback loop. And it's not that we haven't understood it, but I don't think we have carefully not thought about it and carefully not examined it. So when we pick a particular school system, when we particular, pick a particular tax system or a redistributive system, it has immediate impact, but it also shapes our ideas of what's fair. And we need to understand that much better. And we are now, in order to try to shed some light on that, we are now launching a kind of study that are presented here in 60 countries. And we really hope to, to at least provide some empirical answers to that question. OK, thank you. So this was an experimental test. When I didn't give the notice, they still kept to 25 minutes and 34 seconds. So well done. You guys have. I have, uh, thank you so much, Bartel. Mm -hmm. I have a question for you from, actually I have two from the audience, and there may be somebody here too. Uh, okay, so the first question. Another concept of often used in this context is justice. How would you say that justice relates to equality and fairness? And I'm, you don't get another 25 minutes. But so quickly. So, uh, so this is way too big a question. I, 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 <laughs> I mean, I attended lectures by, by Rawls in, uh, at, uh, at Harvard when I was a student there. And he, he spent his whole life, I mean, I mean uh, mm. outlining this relationship between justice and fairness. I think justice is a broader notion than fairness. So the, at least the fairness I've been talking about is the fairness in the particular income space. I mean, he, of course, has a much bigger... Uh, idea of justice in the basic institutions. Uh, so basically, I think it, 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 it's just broader. But of course, I mean, as we know, also he had the idea that fairness is a critical part of, of, of justice. Okay, so is there something like a common sense in society about what is a fair distribution? Or is it just the sum of unequally distributed perceptions? Very nicely framed question. No, so, so I think there, there are two issues here. I mean, I think one very deep question is what should we make of these kind of findings for the normative debate about how we ought to organize society, right? About the fundamental question of what is a just society. And a lot of philosophers have been very reluctant to taking into account the intuitions of everyone and so on. And I think I'm not sure exactly what to make out of this. And I don't want to make big claims in the end. I think we need, I mean, the democratic system to... To, to basically help us determining this. What I'm interested in is understanding people's perceptions because I think this is fundamental for understanding how society develops, for understanding conflicts, for understanding why we don't manage to reach a bargaining outcome when uh, and a lot of money gets lost. Well, people have different ideas of the fairness aspect of it. So, so when I... I don't think there is a common sense understanding of fairness. I think people deviate a lot. How that should map into the normative conclusions, I don't know. But I certainly think it's critical for to, to, that that is taken into the positive analysis of, of how society is organized. Great. I would allow one question from the audience. And I see a woman in a white blouse. So you get the last question. 
Yeah, thank you for the presentation. A question for clarification. Uh, you talk a lot about people. So among whom did you do the experiments? And are there differences between men and women? A higher, lower class, a higher, lower education, uh, young and old. Uh, I, I would like to see a bit more of that differentiation. Wonderful question. If I had two more hours, I would love to go into the details. But let, let me just answer the, 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 the big picture. So our study now was done with representative samples. What I mean by that is representative in the sense that they are representative on certain observables for the whole society in Norway and in the US. Economists or behavioral scientists started out this by doing it with students. And I just want to end very quickly. And then we can talk more about the, the, I mean, these different groups and so on uh, later. So what, what it started out, so you know, economists for a long time had this obsession of applying the wonderful theoretical model we have by just imputing that, well, basically what we care about is money for ourselves. I mean, it's not like that is what the theory says, but that's typically how we applied it. So now we really, I mean, economists are not easily convinced, um, but I mean, after some time, I mean, this experiment that's called the dictator game, which is a version of what you saw, where you ask people to divide money in an anonymous setting, you basically refuted this theory. I mean, you saw that people are dividing money when they think it's fair. These experiments, going through your questions, were done with students. Maybe even students in your own class and so on. What was the re initial reaction of economists? Was that, <laughs> come on. I mean, these are students. I mean, they don't know anything about life, right? So, I mean, they have not been out there. They have not <laughs> seen the harsh environment and so on. So, come back with evidence from real people. Meaning, a representative population. If you take the behavior of the students and compare that to representative population in, the, in this setting, what do you think you find? You find, I mean, in, with the students you see a lot of fair behavior and so on. With the representative population you see much more. So it's not, I mean, so the students, I mean, I mean, so you come into the real world, you really understand that, I mean, in the real world there's a lot of fairness transactions going on, right? So that is, that is one very important dimension that we now try to move this old stuff into representative populations. We see differences along all these lines that you, uh, you had in mind. We see females being more egalitarian. One amazing thing is how is this moral motivation developing uh, in adolescence and childhood? Think of this. This is like language. We have, and it, I think it should totally change how we think about our policies towards kids. What you pick up in childhood and adolescence basically decides what you think is fair in, the, in adulthood. So we saw this, I mean, the Norwegian kids from 10 to 20, 10, very different from adults, 20, they're spot on adults, and it ma maps very clearly the social institutions that they are facing in adolescence. So. You know what, thank you. I'm gonna call all, thank you so much, Bartel. I'm gonna 